Bene, let me introduce you the moderator, Dominic Salvatore. No, 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 preferisco. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. It's a pleasure to moderate this most distinguished panel on a most important topic. Is the world facing a new global financial crisis? I will uh, very briefly introduce the topic, then introduce the speakers, and then we proceed with the uh, panel. As we know, the United States is growing very moderately, anemic growth, 2.2%, and perhaps that is the expectation a bit higher for the next few years. Europe and Japan are pra practically growing no more than 1%. We know that uh, Brazil is in a deep recession, 3% negative growth this year, recession next year. Russia, deep recession this year, recession less deep next year. The other emerging markets in the G20 are growing between 1 to 2 or 3 percent, and that for them sounds like almost recession. So we are uh, in a delicate situation, as Professor Stiglitz and I mentioned yesterday. Uh, 2016 probably, uh, probably will not be much better than 2015. We have to be positive, but we also have to be realistic. Uh, if uh, anything, if any shock that we do not know and the panelists will indicate the possibility of any shock coming, uh, we may then get into a crisis. The problem is that we have used all of our munitions to overcome the previous crisis. Interest rates zero practically in nominal terms, negative in real terms, and of course we have uh, huge debts, government debts, and so the question is, if a new crisis come, we may have uh, difficulties. But this is what the panel will be discussing. And the way we will proceed is I will go first introduce the panelists, then very briefly around the panel to indicate what they think the probability of a crisis is, and if a crisis would come, where they think will be the spark, where it will be coming from. Then I'll go around the panelists once again in order to uh, uh, give them the time to elaborate on, uh, on the crisis or what is the probability and where it may come from. Uh, then we open up the discussion among the panelists, leaving about 10, 15 minutes at the end from questions from the floor. Uh, we want to know what people in the field uh, or directing firms, financial and otherwise, think of what, because obviously their decisions for the future depends on this. For example, General Motors, as you know, sells more cars in China than in the United States. And yet this year, uh, General Motors thought it would sell one million cars than it actually is selling. Therefore, they made a terrible mistake. Now they, either, they have the preparation to sell one million cars more, and so those that they have produced and cannot sell at the expected price, they have to take a hit on selling below uh, what the price they indicated. But these are the topics that we will discuss. So I will uh, go uh, around the table. Uh, I introduce the panelists uh, as they are listed in the program. First, uh, uh, Professor Joe Stiglitz. He needs no introduction. Joe, please come up. And let's give him a round of applause. Then we have um, Gregor Hurt from um, uh, UBS Asset Management. Greg. Uh, then Anya Hochberg, who was here before the previous panel, so we overwork Anya, please. Credit Suisse. And as we usually say, last but not least, obviously, Donald Amstead of uh, Aberdeen AM uh, Asia. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, we have a change uh, uh, in the program. Instead of uh, uh, Mr. Kasabrakis, we have uh, Jelen uh, Quellen from, uh, uh, from Swiss Court. So we have all the panelists here. Thank you. Yes. 
So what we will do now is uh, uh, we have agreed the way to go around is first to, uh, for each panelist, briefly, very briefly, just to say what they think the probability of a new global financial crisis in the next uh, two or three years is, and if it will come, where do they think the spark is coming from? Is it coming from uh, China, from the United States, from Europe, and in what sector? Uh, just briefly, and then we go around again, as I've said, to, for each panelist to elaborate on what this overall uh, picture or uh, uh, anticipation of what they expect. Joe, why don't we start with you? Well, I think there's a, uh significant or is this a, uh, a not insignificant probability of uh, a crisis over the next three years, uh, largely caused by uh, the fact that uh, monetary policy, QE, has created asset price bubbles. And with high interdependencies, high leverage, uh, when those bubbles break, it will have consequences. Uh, I think we're probably in a better position to manage them than we were th in 2008. But uh, I, I, I think that uh, there is not, as I say, an, a not insignificant chance that there will be an event of that kind. Mm -hmm. So it's primarily from the financial bubble in the financial sector. If a crisis comes, that's the yeah. direction it will come from. And maybe I should clarify here. You know, the word crisis is different from a slow growth, a malaise, a uh, near recession. You know, 3%, 3.5% for the global economy is viewed like a recession. Uh, you know, zero is the number around which the advanced countries focus, but for the emerging markets, if they're growing at 3%, that's a, a real problem. And It feels like a recession. It feels like a recession. And so, but that's not a crisis in the same way that we think of a financial crisis, a foreign exchange crisis, a currency crisis. And so uh, your question was about a crisis as opposed to just an ordinary uh, dysfunctional market economy. Very good. Thank you. Greg? Yeah, I would agree with most of the points. As a fund manager, I need to be able to predict what will happen in the next three years. So I would say we're going to see a correction on the market. I think the probability is 25%. Now a crisis, that's something different. I would say, as in agreeing with you, that we are further away and uh, in a better situation than we were perhaps uh, in 2009. So I would guess less than 5%. Uh, I also see the origin, I would say, in emerging market. I think that we have major structural issues over there. And another point which uh, we don't allude to often is uh, productivity. We have a decline in productivity. Uh, might be related also to the aging of the population. Uh, we, we got used to having uh, endless labor forces coming into the market. This is stopping in Europe, in the US, and now in emerging markets. Could be an issue also. And of course, as you mentioned, over-leveraging of the whole financial system, but as long as central banks are there to provide us with our daily shot, we're pretty happy as fund managers. So you also think it's not really a crisis, it may be a, a anemic growth, but not a, a crisis as such. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's building up. We see uh, structural issues coming to us, but I think not in the next three years. Very good. Anya? Well, actually, you would expect uh, someone from the other big um, the bank in Switzerland to, uh, you know, outrageously disagree, uh, you know, with uh, what you have said. Unfortunately, I think I very much share the same picture. Um, we would certainly see um, declining returns on the equity market side and also on the fixed income market side over the next couple uh, of years. What my personal concern is in terms of the longer term development is something which is connected to the productivity issue, which is the decline in investments. Uh, this is really something where I feel we kind of cut almost off our ability to deal with uh, future economic growth. This is for me also a result of the ultra-low interest rate. This has actually shifted uh, incentives to some degree in a negative way also. If you would 
pushed me, however, you know, to the crisis question, not just the longer term economic um, question. Um, uh, we would not expect a financial market crisis in our main scenario, in a side scenario with a probability which is below 20%, uh, so not zero, but still something, you know, we should be at least um, discussing um, the high leverage, especially of Chinese corporate firms, is something, you know, which we have a closer uh, look at. Uh, we go on, uh, Dano. Um, I come from a more Asian uh, perspective, and uh, in Chinese society, seven is a very unlucky number. She, <laughs> it means death. So in my lifetime in financial markets, we've had crises in 1987, crisis in 1997, starting in 2007. So I confidently predict that the next crisis will be in 2017. <laughs> so I think my uh, panelists from uh, UBS and Credit Suisse are quite safe with their economic forecast for the next 12 months, um, but I do worry what's going to happen uh, the 12 months after that. So maybe, Professor, I should come back in 12 months' yes. time. Um, <laughs> and then I could say with uh, more certainty that there's definitely going to be a crisis uh, in, the, in the upcoming year. Uh, in terms of where the crisis is going to come from, I think there are two possible seeds of the crisis. If one thinks about the global financial system today, it is built, of course, on confidence. And the essential confidence that central bankers around the world need you all to have as investors is confidence in their, in their ability to create inflation of 2%. And ladies and gentlemen, we've had QE in the United States since 2009 in the ECB, a little bit later in the Bank of Japan, and no central bank anywhere in the world is anywhere close to generating 2% inflation. And when investors finally wake up to this reality and then begin to lose confidence in the central banks, that's, I think, the cause of the financial crisis. I think the second disconnect is politics. Uh, I mean, I, I, and, you know, I really uh, find your presentation very commendable. Uh, I mean, in my lifetime, the only economy that you've really had to analyze to understand global financial markets is the U.S. economy. And now you have to analyze not just the U.S., but Europe, but Japan, the U.K., China, India, Brazil. I mean, the world is just such a complicated place to analyze. And the chances of making a mistake, as the markets clearly did in their analysis of China and the events of August this year, that is also going to lead to a crisis. I mean, we could have had an unnecessary crisis. We almost did in September. Yeah. Um, and when politics comes into play, uh, the politicians around the world, the caliber of politicians in my country, the UK, they are all financially illiterate. Uh, they barely understand a bond yield. The only indicator they understand is possibly the stock market and maybe the currency. And I think the level of financial illiteracy at the political level is a real crisis for the West. And when I look at leaders like Xi Jinping in China, Li Keqing, the Prime Minister of China, uh, Li Xianlong, the Prime Minister of Singapore, and I compare them with David Cameron and George Osborne in the UK, um, let alone uh, some of the candidates that uh, Professor Stiglitz's country is putting up for the presidency, um, I think it's pretty clear where the crisis is going to be and where it's going to come from. Thank you. Uh, Jan? Yeah, thank you. I agree mostly on your first point. Let's look at some facts. In Europe, we are in the era of zero interest rate policy since 2008 plus three massive quantitative easing. Um, what is the result of, the, of this monetary policy? Zero inflation, very far away from the 2% from the uh, inflation target that the Fed has to, has to obtain from its dual mandate. Also, no, the, um, the unemployment rate is pretty stable, but we can still question about those figures. And also the GDP, even if it's positive above 2% every quarter, do you have to know that for each dollar of revenues, in the United States has to provide at least three dollars debt to enter into at least three dollars debt. So, and in Europe, we have started the, exactly the same policy. 
So uh, massive quantitative easing and Mario Draghi, which is uh, with, in my opinion already concerned about the true efficiency of this policy, he said, okay, let's increase the duration of this, uh, of this quantitative easing and also its pace. We also know the results in, um, in Japan. You know, the, uh, we, can, we can already question the, uh, the efficiency of this um, policy. So, in my opinion, the crisis, will, the crisis will come from the monetary policy divergence because markets are already, already pricing in the, the red hike, the US red hike, but actually it's not, it's not happening. And the Fed is very afraid just to raise uh, a rate of uh, 25 basis points, which is very, very low, but they are very, very afraid. And at each new data, they say, okay, so it's for now, it's for now. So the US economy is really um, gaining strength for, uh, for this expectation. But the crisis will come from this, uh, this differential, this, this monetary policy divergence that doesn't exist, in my opinion. Thank you. So from this first round, it seems like no one really is predicting a crisis in the old-fashioned way, in the way of the 2008. But there are difficulties, and the difficulties primarily arise from the financial sector. Actually, what Donald said, we had even more nearly global crisis. We had one in 1987, one in 1991-92, where the UK and Italy devalued uh, uh, the currency very much and uh, allowed uh, Soros to earn profits, $2 billion in a few weeks' work. However, then he made four other calls, and all were wrong. He lost, in total, $1.6 billion, but he still remained with a net $400 million. <laughs> of, uh, uh, so we had a crisis, really five crises in 27, 28 years. So according to some uh, who do not know or would say that uh, the next crisis is overdue or due very, uh, uh, very soon. Uh, we haven't heard Rubini lately on uh, predicting crisis. Uh, of course, he had convinced us that he had predicted the, the previous crisis, and he predicted nothing. But anyway, he's now silent on the crisis. They're very careful now on predicting what. Uh, so what, I, what we will do now is go around the table again in view of what all the panelists have indicated. And again, uh, three, four minutes to each to elaborate on uh, what they've already said and in view of what the other panelists had indicated, starting from Joe. You can be in more detail now. Okay, well, the, the first uh, source of a crisis that none of the panelists have mentioned we, and, and I think is probably one of the real risks is a Euro crisis. I think uh, we, they, they, they uh, temporarily solved the Greek problem but the fundamental flaws in the structure of the Eurozone have not been addressed. And it is inevitable, I believe, that eventually the, that flawed structure that does not allow adjustment uh, will have significant consequences. I think there will be another Euro crisis. Uh, the, uh, Europe was saved the last time, you might say, by Draghi's statement, uh, he'll do whatever it takes. Uh, that was what I call a confidence trick. When I say confidence trick, that's, I don't know if that's a, uh, it's an American expression, I don't know if you have it, which is that you, pretend, you get confidence only on the basis of uh, uh, a charade, uh, a shell game. And uh, if push came to shove, there would be nothing there behind that assertion particularly given the political economy of Germany not willing to do whatever it takes. So to me, I think uh, the one thing that this group hasn't mentioned is the real risk of yeah. uh, the next bout of a Euro crisis, uh, the likelihood that they will manage their way through that crisis, muddling through, uh, I think is very high, at an enormous cost of continuing stagnation. So in a way, the link between what we've described as slow growth and crisis is precisely that, that one solves the crisis by tying one's hands and uh, having uh, this uh, very, very low growth. Uh, on the uh, broader issue of uh, 
monetary policy uh, generating uh, a crisis. Um, I think uh, what's been very clear is that all this expansion of credit, of, of, of liquidity, has not had, as everybody has said, the inflationary effects that some people feared. Uh, one of the other uh, major, Amer uh, several of the American major uh, uh, hedge funds who ma had made good bets actually have lost uh, billions of dollars on the bet that QE would lead to inflation. It's not. And the reason that it is not is that the primary determinant of inflation, the first order effect, is demanding supply. And there's a shortage of aggregate demand, as I talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, and uh, in particular, if you link that with uh, the peculiar economic model in China, which is so supply-driven, uh, that has, uh, we've all benefited on, uh, on the inflationary side. Uh, in my mind, uh, it is not inflation or deflation uh, itself that uh, should be a concern. Uh, what should be concerned is two things. One, low inflation or deflation is a sign, a signal that we don't have adequate aggregate demand. That is that sort of the stagnation aspect. And, and that is very, very uh, clear. Secondly, uh, given the level of indebtedness, uh, a traditional way of managing indebtedness is to inflate it away. But when you have deflation, leverage increases. And so the, the, we're, we've not been am, able to manage the debt levels in the standard way by inflation. Uh, and uh, 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 the, with, with the fear of more debt constraining fiscal policy with the obvious fact that monetary policy has reached the limits in stimulating the economy, I think those two, I won't say causing a crisis, but are going to cause anemic growth. And the realization that there is this ahead of us, a long period of anemic growth, will have market effects. I think uh, when I, we talk about bubbles, the interaction of the uh, um, constraints on monetary policy and the realization that the real economy is not going to be go doing well could have, you, I think you called it a correction, and the question is how big of that correction and how interconnected the economy is, how many uh, derivative bets have been made on some of these uh, uh, phenomena. When I say derivative bets, there are a whole set of bets. You know, the oil companies made huge bets on uh, high oil prices. Uh, they're being forced now to cut back on their investment. There are huge write downs. Uh, these are just examples. I just mentioned that as one sector. Uh, it is quite clear that there can be, particularly in our interconnected and highly leveraged markets with derivatives, there can be ramifications of these kinds of, uh, of adjustments. Uh, and the final observation, while I have um, a great deal of confidence that China will be able to manage its way through the, the next period, what does worry me a little bit is that it doesn't today have any real plan B if there is a crisis. That is to say, what it did back in 2008 was uh, the best example ever of Keynesian stimulus. They had read our textbooks better than anybody in Washington or, or Brussels. So they get A's and our guys get really D's or F's. But the question is, having stimulated the economy, the Chinese economy, through things like a Im massive increase in debt, some very peculiar things in real estate related to local government, you, it's going to be very difficult to replay that if there is a crisis.
and for my discussions uh, with uh, uh, in China, I am not. I, I'm. I am uh, fairly convinced that they don't at this juncture have a plan B if they face a crisis. Very good. So you think the problem may arise uh, Europe, uh, the EU, uh, then uh, deflation and the debt, which becomes more difficult to, uh, uh, to maintain or to uh, service, and then the China and the policies. Well, frankly, uh, with the EU, uh, most Americans, most Americans, including many of the most distinguished, uh, actually predicted six months, up to six months of the creation of the euro, that the euro would not be created, and if created, it would fail. We failed to understand. Rudy Dornbusch had you, an article in Foreign Affairs saying uh, uh, euro fantasies, in other words, dream on. And this was six months or one year before the creation uh, of the euro. Yeah. Can I just say, that, that was a political judgment. Yeah. The economic judgment that the euro would not work so far has been perfectly predictable. Of course. That, that the, even the euro crisis, the imbalances, were in some sense facilitated by the euro. So some people say, well, really, it, we, we shouldn't, you know, the euro crisis was created by the American crisis. Absolutely. Uh, the real answer is, the euro was not working from 1999 until 2008-10. What was happening was you were getting the imbalances that then became evidenced in 2010 that you now are dealing with. So my view is the euro has never worked. It has never worked because it's built on one leg. We walk on two legs, the only monetary and not the fiscal. If a country asymmetrically from the others in the euro got into a crisis, they could not do monetary policy. It's done by the European Central Bank. They could not do fiscal policy, the Maastricht criteria, and they could not do uh, anything really about uh, uh, the budget because we had the Maastricht criteria. So uh, Greece, the only thing they could do internally devaluation, and this has been from crisis to crisis. Not falling, but from crisis to crisis. Uh, Gregor, why don't we go with you? Yes, I think there were many points discussed, so I'm going to try to, to discuss two or three of them, starting with, with the Eurozone. And well, last year, Mr. Trichet, with, uh, with also a few interesting points. Um, from, from my point of view, where we stay at the present stage is actually quite an ideal one in the Eurozone. Uh, and it was until the migration crisis. And you mentioned before uh, that politicians don't understand economics. I would say that we as financial market specialists have some trouble to understand politics. So it goes in, bo in both directions. And uh, the European project was also pushed through in crisis. You need a crisis to make the guys move forward. And I think the crisis we had in the Eurozone because of the euro, would have been the perfect storm to force people to come together and to have a fiscal consolidation. Uh, I think that's the plan of the founding father. It was also the plan somehow of Miss Merkel, and now came the migration crisis. And that's one of the points I never read of, is Miss Merkel leaving the, the job as councillor. It's my, one of my major tail risks in the next two years. Uh, you don't read it. She's under freaking tremendous pressure in Germany by the CSU. It's very powerful. Uh, you can feel that Mr. Schäuble sees his last chance coming. And it could, and he's, I mean, he's an economist. He knows the stuff, but he's a technocrat. And he will, he will actually push the Eurozone project to fail. I'm convinced of that. And I'm very worried about this situation in the actual environment. So that's, that's a big worry from my side. And I agree with everybody, you know, the, the Eurozone without the fiscal coordination doesn't work. It will not work. It's then a question of timing. I, I recall writing a paper when I was young, economist with you actually at Credit Suisse, back in 99, that uh, it wouldn't work. Uh, it, I would have been wrong as a fund manager for many years, losing a lot of clients. And I would say in the next two years, it will continue to work and we're going to model through. But we need a solution there. The, the other point uh, <coughs> is really on, um, on the regulatory side. And being with UBS, I will not criticize them. <laughs> I will just make a comment what the consequences are. The consequence is that actually you're taking liquidity out of the market. Uh, you make sure that investment banks don't have warehousing. We're having increasing trouble to find counterparties, increasing. And this simply means that for our clients, it's becoming a mess also. Uh, 
it's becoming pretty difficult. And you might have seen many charts about you know, warehousing in uh, investment banks going down. We haven't had the perfect storm yet to provoke the crisis. And that could be actually the catalysator of the, of the next crisis uh, to come. I'm very worried about that. The last point I allu alluded to before, and it's going back to what you mentioned also, but it's one of these catalysators also is, uh, is the aging population. Uh, I simply see that we have non-economic investors in the market. These are pension funds. They just look at hedging their liabilities, which explains also why interest rates stay, stay so low. You know, if you have a non-economic investor, and we see that in Switzerland also, this guy, they buy bonds at negative interest rates. And they say, well, we just need to hedge it. Uh, no, my point would be to give, to give an advice to the Swiss government, well, take a 50 billion perpetual loan and then you finance the whole pension fund Swiss, uh, system in Switzerland for the next 100 years. Uh, but that's exactly the other side of the balance. They are not only real investors like us, it's also people who have simply to hedge. Uh, population is aging, people are saving. We, we're in this perfect kind of you know, part of the cycle for the next 20 years where baby boomers are getting older, they're still in the market, you need to pay down a little bit, and then in 20 years, they will need the money. We're seeing it in Japan. People need the money because they have retired. And then I think we could have a quite a substantial financial crisis. I will stop with this one. I have some other stuff on monetary policy. Having been an assistant in monetary policy, uh, which was completely unsexy 20 years ago, you didn't get women with that. I can tell you now I'm very surprised at how powerful actually central banks have become, at least in the mind of people. Uh, my view is still that uh, there's not a lot of power in central banks. You know, it's a real economy, it's demand supply, it's productivity that makes the economy. And this focus on, on these people is wrong. It's wrong. That's not what's going to make the, the world economy grow, actually. Sorry Thank for you very that. much. Thank you. Anya? I think what, you know, very much came to my mind when I was listening, you know, to my to my um, colleagues here on the panel was, yes, I guess there is something like, you know, the law of unintended consequences of, you know, what politicians do, and especially being in the same business. And then, Gregor, I do worry about the ability or non-ability of banks taking risk in, you know, special circumstances and working actually as a buffer against, you know, major market um, uh, developments. We have so far not been in a situation where uh, we would have to, um, you know, quickly react on strong market developments. But even what we have seen uh, over the course of this year has given us, I would say, a first feeling of what does it actually mean, uh, you know, to interact in an environment of low liquidity. Um, what I would like to add um, to the discussion, and I think I'm, I'm, I, I feel really passionate about um, that, that for me, the, the euro has always been much more than just an economic construct. For me, uh, maybe also because of my very own vita, you know, it has always been a political um, uh, decision, and especially this political fact will um, make it work. Even so, if it's not an optimal currency union, I think we can uh, have an endless debate um, on that. But many of the challenges we currently face in in Europe, uh, in my view, would not be uh, we would not be able to adequately, you know, tackle um, uh, them. In my personal view, the, the disparities within the eurozone have greatly diminished uh, in the course of the crisis. The uh, the uh, excess surplus in Germany uh, has well at least diminished a bit. Uh, the, the deficit in Spain, in the periphery, has also um, moved to uh, almost zero. So for me, uh, I think the, the euro is something you know which will be with us for quite a while, whether we still have all the countries in there in the next couple of years is a totally different um, debate here as well. Um, the, uh, from an economic point of view, there are two, two other things which for me are, are important. First of all, the, the inflation um, uh, debate. Um, I would agree if we would not manage to reflate the economy, then certainly that could pose uh, you know, a big you know, danger, not just, you know, to, to debt developments, but also to global economic development. However, for me, and maybe that's a, a bit too simplistic view, um, inflation uh, or, or reflating the economy is a bit like, and, you know, apologies if there would be some, some central banker in the room, um, is a bit like boiling uh, water here. You know, you, you try for quite a while, but it takes you a while until you see the bubbles, you know, in your, uh, you know, in the, in the pan. And if you're not cooking on gas and can take it away easily, Easily the heat, then it will be cooking for a while because you know the the, the often it's still you know hot enough to to keep it on a very high temperature. And this is exactly what we are looking for. I would also not say that uh, for the next couple of years we have too much uh, uh, too, too little aggregate demand. I really feel that we are in a catching up process. And the very fact that we actually invest not enough, at least in the developed world, will actually make. 
I would say inflation a very non-linear phenomenon. Uh, at the moment, yes, uh, there is a lack of aggregate demand, but at some point this will accelerate, and given then the lack of an adequate supply, I feel we might jump from an, I would say, very suppressed inflation environment straight into, I would say, even overshooting of inflation um, expectations. And something, uh, you know, we have also not addressed, and I guess, you know, time-wise you might not be able to do so, is um, commodity prices. Commodity prices, not as an indication of you know current current um, economic weakness because you all know this is really excess supply but oil prices of course um, they do uh, come with also some distribution issues what would the world look like if we would have oil prices of around 20 US dollar per barrel I would say political developments also in the Middle East even if the if the Saudis can could technically survive with such an oil price, but certainly it would not be enough, um, I would say, to address some of the very urgent also social problems uh, we face over there. So one of the problems is the, Euro the Europe, the European Union, and as I said yesterday, the problem is uh, there are two problems. Often they are to uh, spoken as if they are the same problem. There is the uh, weak uh, periphery of the Eurozone, uh, which is heavily indebted, but even if that uh, indebtedness by miracle, and I don't believe in miracles, disappeared, the problem would remain. They require restructuring. They are unable to compete. And then there is the other problem, the European Union as such, which is now growing, dead in the water. Growth of 1% uh, is hardly growth. Of course, for next year, the prediction is 1.5, 1.6, but as I said yesterday, predictions have to be rosy, to be encouraging, but they are always growth is higher next year, but 1.5% is hardly growth. As Joe also discussed less, uh, yesterday, however, uh, that we had the commodity cycle, as Anya suggested. Uh, emerging markets did not take advantage of that to restructure the economy again, uh, away from over-reliance on primary commodities, and now the crisis came, primary commodity prices are the same as in 1990, they need to restructure, but they don't have the money. Restructuring is done when things are doing well, uh, but uh, they, then they are not done, and now you have a problem. But we move on to Donald, and I'm sure he wants to say something more about China than he said in the introduction. Um, to, I mean, just to follow up on the point about commodity prices and this idea that a collapse in commodity prices is a crisis for emerging markets. Well, of course, it's a crisis for countries that produce commodities. It's not a crisis for countries that import commodities. It's a transfer of wealth to commodity importing parts of the world. And Asia, particularly China and India, have just had an enormous transfer of wealth to them because they are two of the countries that today import and in the future will import a, a huge proportion of the world's commodities. So uh, I think we have to be careful about distinguishing between uh, importing countries and exporting countries. Uh, but let me go back to, to politics and uh, to Western politics in particular um, and uh, why I think Western politics is where we need to be very careful. Let's go back to the global financial crisis and uh, to think about the response of central banks with uh, QE and these extraordinary measures. QE was meant to be a temporary response to the crisis by central banks to allow politicians to pass the necessary structural reforms so that economies could once again grow normally. And the central bankers, God bless them, they've done their bit and they've kept their side of the bargain. But the politicians, quite frankly, are absolute scumbags. They <laughs> and they have failed miserably to keep their side of the bargain. I can only talk about my country and MPs in, in, in the Houses of Parliament in Westminster, who, as I've already said, are financially illiterate. I had an MP come to see me in Singapore, and he did not understand what a guilt was. <laughs> He thought that governments got all their money through taxation. He did not understand the gilt market. He'd never heard of it before, and he'd been an MP sitting in the House of Commons for over 40 years. The only financial indicators that most politicians understand are the stock market and the currency. And of course, as soon as central banks pushed the QE button, stock markets rebounded dramatically. And the sense of crisis passed, and therefore the sense of urgency amongst politicians to pass structural reform passed as well. 
and we're back to where we started. We're probably even worse because the biggest banks in the world just got bigger and they're probably even more difficult to deal with if there's a crisis at any one of them, although fortunately they're being run reasonably well at the moment. So that's the first point about the political crisis. The second point about the political crisis, and I think I have to be a little more uh, loud and direct here, is, ladies and gentlemen, the West is bankrupt. A lot of the presentations we hear and see about the debt crisis focus on the debt. The debt is irrelevant. What is relevant are the liabilities. And if you listen to Bill Gross from two years ago, when he was still at PIMCO, when he knew what he was talking about, <laughs> He wrote this very famous paper saying that the liabilities of the US government, and I think this was in the summer of 2014 or 13, were over 100 trillion US dollars. Now the size of the US bond market, the US treasury market is about 17 trillion dollars. That means in broad numbers there are about 83 trillion, or there were 83 trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities for the US government. And that is a crisis. The liabilities to GDP of the US government is about five or 600% of GDP. In the UK, it's a very similar number. And so I worry that the conversation is just not even on the, on, on the right subject. We talk about debt to GDP, we should be looking at liabilities to GDP. And the reason why this matters, let me give you a story. Let me tell you very briefly about the two of the most important women in my life, my mother and my mother-in-law. My mother, God bless her, a little 85-year-old lady who lives in London. And whenever I go to London, I go and see my mother. Uh, I was with her this weekend, and I say, Mum, how are you? Is there anything I can do for you? And she says, no thanks, Don, I'm fine. And of course, the reason why she's fine is because she gets paid a pension by the UK government. She's been paid a pension, by the way, for the last 25 years. She receives free health care on the National Health Service, a free bus pass, a free television license, and a winter fuel heating allowance now that winter's coming in. So the other thing I do when I go to London is I go into the Aberdeen Asset Management Office, and I go around the office and I thank all my colleagues for paying so much tax that my mother can live in such comfort. Now, I'm a little flippant, I am a UK taxpayer, even though I live in Singapore, or I, I live in Malaysia. So that's my mother. And the great thing about my mother, by the way, is she's not even English, she's Australian. Now, pensions in the UK were introduced firstly in the 1920s, and they were only for men. And then we've had, since then we've had women's lib, huh? Pensions were introduced originally for men at the age of 65. Well, in the 1920s, life expectancy in the UK was 55. So if you live 10 years longer than the average male, the government paid you a pension, and they didn't pay women a pension at all. And now, the UK taxpayer is supposed to fund the last 13, 14 years of the average male and the last 17 or 18 years of the average female. And this money comes out of tax revenue. There is no magic pot of savings. Actually, Britain's best ever export was the pension savings system called CPF that's used in Singapore today, EPF that's used in Malaysia, MPF that's used in Hong Kong, and indeed the system in Australia, whereby people are forced to save. But let me introduce you to my mother-in-law, a little Chinese lady who lives in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. She receives not one cent in help from the Malaysian government. I, as her eldest and best paid son-in-law, I am her social security system. I had the honor, the privilege, the delight to buy a house for her. And when she wasn't happy with that house, I invited her into my home so that the plumber, the plasterer, the electrician, the gardener could go in and do up her house to the specification that she wanted. And when she goes into hospital, I'm the one who, pay, who picks up the hospital bills. Now this is a metaphor for Social Security Asian style, and of course I exaggerate a little and it is beginning to change. But one of the problems with the financial system today is that pension funds in Switzerland, in the UK, are being forced now to lend money at, in Switzerland's cases, negative interest rates, 
to institutions that are bankrupt. And one of the worst consequences, one of the most pernicious consequences of QE is that investors globally have lost any idea of common sense, any idea of value. And when you have these quantitative methods for valuing companies, when the discount rate is zero, how do you apply a value to a cash stream of dividends from a company? Financial modeling goes out the window, and so the whole system really is a house of cards. And people now invest on the basis of momentum. And the real crisis facing all of us as investors is that we use passive products. We literally buy stuff that we don't understand. We lend money to companies in a bond index. The more indebted the company, the more indebted the government, the more we lend to it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is financial suicide. And I think what all of you as investors need to do is to take a grip of reality and think about every single investment that goes into your portfolio and focus on quality. And the problem is, as they say, the rising tide lifts all boats. Well, unfortunately, at the moment, even the shares of, pardon my French, really crappy companies are doing well. Everyone today invests in high yield. High yield bonds used to be called junk bonds because they are issued by companies that are junk. And yet for most of you, I'm sure, high yield is now a core asset class. Donald, we have to <laughs> give okay. uh, the other. Thank Just you. Just grab your senses. Think sensibly. Think about what you're doing. And just focus on quality. And that's the only way that we know to advise you to survive the next financial crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you. Jan. Thank you. I think you are right on focusing on, on quality. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about the Western crisis and in the Eurozone. So I want you to wonder why Mario Draghi has decided to apply the same monetary policy as what has been done in the US and in Japan with the result that we know right now. But let's focus a bit more on Greece. So, Greece has a massive debt-to-GDP ratio. I know you don't like the debt-to-GDP ratio, <laughs> but uh, it's almost 200%. And actually, right now, what is happening with Greece is that with, we are only saving time before Greece is exiting the euro. But Europe, right now, my conclusion, Europe is only making people poorer. And the impossibility to depays its own currency will only pave the way to more austerity policies. This is what is happening right now. And as a result, what, what can we see in uh, Europe, like in Portugal or in Spain? As people are, are getting poorer, they are getting back on their own identity. We can see that in Spain and also um, in Portugal. Let's, have, you, have you heard about what happened uh, a week or two weeks before? when? It's, it has been said by the constitutional president that the Europe was much more important than the democracy because the leftist government wanted to apply anti-austerity policy. So Europe is dead, in my opinion, as soon as we don't have at least fiscal, fiscal reforms. It only makes uh, people poorer, and this is what is happening. In, in the US, it's more or less the same thing. When we know that more or less 90 million it's, it's just huge, are on food stamps. Why are we talking about like some, uh, the next global crisis? Because we are still, right now, in a global crisis. So the, on, the money is free. So where is the money going? To the stock market and to a bubble. So for sure, at some point, at some, the stock market is gonna at least collapse or at, at least getting back on its, uh, on its real values. And regarding um, China, I think it's only just, um, let's say, a structural uh, change of China, which is uh, uh, shifting towards a more domestic economy. So from um, an economy previously directed to the, to the exports. So for sure, when we understand at least mathematics, we know that um, having a 10% growth each year, it's just barely exponential. It means that just to produce, uh, to have uh, this 10% uh, growth, it's, you need um, more than the reserve of what Earth 
uh, can provide you uh, in the long term. So um, with the with the China shifting at some at some moment, so we, um, we sh I think that we can we have to remodel the way we assess the, um, an economy and not only on growth and not only on inflation, but much more on um, on real employment and real purchasing power. So. So to, to conclude my, my point, so the next crisis is not in two years, it's not in three years' time, it's right now that is happening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we want, uh, I know that Joe Stiglitz is dying to reply to some of these things said, yes, somewhat different opinion. A couple of minutes, Joe, to respond to the fact that excesses uh, expenditures or excessive QE may be the cause of uh, some of the problems or... Uh, the, the... Yeah, well, you know, uh, there, there are a number of people who have emphasized this issue that we're spending too much, unfunded... Uh, liabilities like uh, Social Security. Uh, but what that doesn't take into account uh, is the government has uh, enormous taxing power. And if you thought of the taxing power as an implicit asset corresponding to the implicit liabilities, uh, so long as there isn't a political gridlock, we don't really have a problem. And uh, you know, looking at the United States in particular, uh, if you look at our social security, our pension system, uh, it's very clear that it, there may be a little bit of imbalance, but it's not a very big imbalance. Uh, that the magnitude, if we have just a little bit more migration, I know migration but uh, is a, a, a controversy here, but a little bit more migration uh, than is assumed in the models, we have a surplus in our social security. You know, the idea that you're making uh, uh, calculations about the implicit assets and liabilities uh, going out 75 years, when our economic forecasters one year before the global financial crisis couldn't predict what was going to happen, or in the case of Greece, if you look at their forecasts, year after year after year have been absolutely dismal. It seems to me that uh, uh, it's nothing more than fear-mongering to say that we have a, uh, a crisis uh, in, in our public accounts. Now, that doesn't mean that you can simply ignore what's going on, but in that particular area, uh, there really isn't uh, a significant uh, problem in, uh, you might say, the overall balance, balance sheet. I did want to make a, 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 a there, there is this long-standing view that the crisis is the best time to make reforms. Uh, I think there's no empirical evidence about that. In fact, I think it's probably the, uh, the other way, mm -hmm. that uh, when the unemployment rate is very high, is not a good time to tell workers, by the way, we're going to fire you and join the queues of the unemployed and see your family go into poverty and join the food stamp programs in the United States and go on welfare just as welfare is being cut back. Uh, much better when you have a system like in Denmark where they said, let's have flex security, we're going to make uh, reforms, but at the same time, we're going to protect you. So uh, the, the kind of, of situation where they're trying to promote reform uh, in Greece is exactly the wrong set of policies. Now, when I said uh, Europe uh, is or is not working, what I mean is two very simple things. I mean, obviously, the euro survived. So that's a fact we can all agree on. But you ask, the euro was supposed to do two things. It was supposed to promote prosperity, and it was, promote, it was supposed to promote political solidarity. What's clear is that there's more divisiveness in Europe than there ever was. And if you ask about the issue of prosperity, growth has slowed down. Those charts I showed yesterday showed the dismal performance of the Eurozone. That's the average. If you look at Germany, which is one of the better performing, it would get a D, not quite an F, but a D. If you look at its performance outside the grading on the curve of the fact that everybody else is doing so badly. You look at the Eurozone as a whole, it's dismal.
And I believe that dismal performance is because of the euro. <laughs> now, I think you can fix it. And there's a big agenda of how you fix it. The question is a political one. Is there will to make that those political reforms? And I think, I should say more than will, is there the will and is there the economic understanding? And from what I hear, some of the economic, both the will and the economic understanding is not there. And some of this is really trying, uh, uh, will undermine a, a real democratic kind of euro. So I, I think things are going in the wrong direction mm -hmm. right now. There is uh, something lurking behind the possibility of a new crisis. There is that dreadful uh, secular stagnation. And I, uh, I cannot resist the question of asking, uh, Joe, you said yesterday that yes, there is a possibility, but it's not something that we cannot avoid. And we can avoid by spending more, spending more particularly in infrastructures. But we have a, ch uh, we have a country that has done exactly that a country that was not growing, that was in stagnation, that spent 250% of the national debt investing in infrastructures, something that you suggest, and yet that country isn't growing at all, and that is Japan. In other words, the suggestion, yes, we may be going, or we may be facing secular stagnation, but it's not something that we cannot avoid, and one way to avoid is to spend more, not on welfare, but on infrastructure, structures which give long run returns. But Japan has tried that, and Japan has had six recessions in 20 years. Very quickly, I don't want to okay. preclude. So, 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 so two comments. First, if you look at Japan and correct for the fact that its uh, working age population has been going down by 0.25% per year, as opposed to the United States, for instance, where it's growing at 0.75%. That's a 1% gap in the size of the population. In terms of overall performance adjusted for that, Japan is towards the top. So actually, it's only because of, your, of the focus on population, but the world can't stand an increase in population. We're going to have to get used to the fact that population is going to either stabilize or go down. So Japan is not performing poorly. The second point I'd make is, even if it were performing you know, not as well as we would like, infrastructure investment is not a panacea. It's not the only thing that you have to do. And there were some other things that Japan needed to have done. And to say that, OK, they did one thing right, but they did a lot of things else wrong, <laughs> and say, well, that right thing never works, I think is wrong. Mm -hmm. The fact is that the United States has a lot of other, uh, we have a good high tech sector, we have a lot of other sources of strength, but the one thing that we are missing is infrastructure. In other words, it would have been worse and then Japan did not do the things they should do. Exactly. And, that, and uh, in that light, it did not perform badly. Now, I know that we are in Switzerland, we have to be precise, it's lunch, but uh, Ricardo, do we have a, a, uh, uh, five minutes and no more, three minutes for a couple of questions from the floor, or you want us to stop at this point? Yes, is there anyone who would like to ask a question, not a statement, a question, and it can be general or directed specifically at a speaker? And you have the lady here, over here, oh, Ricardo. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sally from uh, Red and White Consulting based in Indonesia and Singapore. Um, okay, so um, in the past one year, I got, uh, my, my company got a chance to explore China in uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and, uh, and Guangzhou. So one thing that uh, we noticed there that China really invests to the fundamental, which is the people. And now they are really keen to invest on the uh, uh, human analytics because they want to improve the analytical capability, not only the what and uh, how, but also why. So th these three things. And then um, the, um, the, the other thing that I noticed from, from, from China, the thing that I would like to, to ask is the, uh, when the investor needs to come, what are the KPI of the country 
that convince the investor, oh, okay, this, is, this country is really healthy. When we did some kind of the uh, correlation... The question, please, the question. Yeah, the, the question is, what, what are the KPI of the country that convince the investor that this country is really healthy? Is that the, uh, the GDP growth is uh, above the inflation rate, or, or what is that? Because they, we don't have any specific guideline for the investor for, for, for this kind of question. Thank you. Joe, let's ask okay. some other. Yeah, I, I, I chaired an international commission on the measurement of economic performance and social progress, which actually goes right to the question. question. And uh, just a couple points. First, GDP is not a good measure. The example of Japan is a really good example because uh, their population is declining and GDP doesn't take into account that, even adjusted for inflation. Uh, second point, uh, if all the GDP goes to a couple people, that's not a good economic performance. Inequality. And the point I made about yesterday was that median income in the United States has stagnated for a quarter century. So in my, my terms, the KPI for the United States is not very good because uh, all, the, all the increases have gone to a very few people uh, at the top. So that's a failed uh, economy. Now there are a whole other set of issues related to sustainability. If, if growth isn't sustainable, growth looked good before 2008, but we now know it was based on unsustainable uh, weaknesses in the fundamentals. So uh, those are all examples of the, f the work. And I, uh, we have a little book called uh, uh, mismeasuring our lives, why GDP doesn't add up, uh, that, that describes uh, why GDP is not a good indicator. Any other on the panel, just a quick response, otherwise we ask Sorry. another question. Yes, sir. Dano. Uh, <clears throat> I would say the only thing you can do is to focus on, when you're investing in, a, in an asset, is focus on the quality of the asset. The problem with lending money to governments is that unlike companies, governments don't produce audited financial statements. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's a fundamental element of, of, of investing. Companies at least give you audited financial statements. When you invest in a company, from our point of view, the only thing that matters is how the management of that company treat minority shareholders. And it's either fairly or unfairly, and unfortunately in China, China is a fail because most companies are run by state-owned enterprises and they don't look after minority shareholders. So therefore, despite stratospheric Chinese GDP growth, the stock market has done nothing apart from the recent bubble. So look at the quality of the company and focus on that and then you'll be okay. Thank you. Another question, the last question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vera Dianov. I'm a PhD student at the University of Freiburg, and my question relates to monetary policy. It's a general question for anyone who, uh, who would like to answer. Um, a few interesting points have been mentioned. So uh, yesterday, Professor Stiglitz mentioned the failure of unconditional central bank uh, lending um, to, fi to filter through to the economy. Today, uh, uh, it was mentioned uh, that the low interest rate environment is skewing investment incentives um, uh, with uh, negative repercussions for future economic growth. And the uh, inability of the central bank to influence inflation has also been mentioned. In light of these considerations, my question is, what should monetary policy aim to achieve realistically, uh, my particular interest is the Federal Reserve, um, in order to uh, meaningfully impact uh, economic growth, particularly aggregate demand. Thank you very much. Yeah. Jan or Anya or, uh, or Greg? Well, I, I gave my kind of Friedmanian uh, answer before, they shouldn't do too much because it's not where real growth is coming from. And I guess especially in the US, we, we start seeing perhaps what I would call the, the beginning of a liquidity trap. You have accumulated too much money and it will come back to the, to the market one day or the other. And I think only the kind of the more fiscal type of intervention can then help in this regard. But no, a lot of economists have different opinion on this one. And we are, we are in uncharted territory now. So whatever happens, somebody will be right in five years time, but I don't know who it's gonna be. Anya or <laughs> Okay, so, so. Uh, QE has had some slight effects, particularly early on, when QE was a form of competitive devaluation. When you had the European Central Bank having to focus on inflation, uh, 
when we lowered our interest rates, it lowered our exchange rate, and that gave us a competitive valuation. Now, I don't recommend this as a, a, as a basis of, of good policy, competitive devaluation, but it worked. Uh, the second thing uh, is that there's been a small effect by creating a stock market bubble. A little of that has trickled down uh, and stimulated the economy a little bit, but again, I don't recommend that as a basis uh, of, of, of policy. What they should have done is uh, to fix the credit channel. So the problem was they created all the liquidity, but they didn't ask, how is that liquidity going to be translated into aggregate demand, more investment? Uh, and that could have been done if they had done about two or three things. First, uh, the smaller regional banks, community banks, that are responsible for most of the SME lending are still very weak. They put all of the $700 billion into the big banks, not into the little banks. Secondly, they could have made a condition for access to the Federal Reserve window that more of the money go to SME lending. They didn't. Several countries have tried that. Thirdly, We've, we have regulations in the United States called CRA, uh, Community Reinvestment Act, that require banks to lend a certain fraction of their portfolio to underserved communities. Again, we could have expanded the CRA to include small businesses, again, providing a, 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 a greater incentive for the banks to lend to small businesses that would have ensured that a larger fraction, not all of it, but a larger fraction of the liquidity go to stimulating uh, our economy. Some of the same things happened to Europe, by the way, with the, the central bank pre uh, lent to banks, banks bought government bonds instead of uh, investing. Exactly. Anya, the last exactly. word. Um, yeah, maybe if I if I may, I'm I'm, I'm not so sure whether um, uh, I would say taking off uh, the free market element um, would help you. As you could also argue that you know the Community Investment Act has even led us you know into a housing bubble in the well, US. That's absolutely wrong. There's been a lot of studies of that, and that's the sort of con uh, standard right wing argument. We've looked at that. Actually, the quality of CRA lending is better than average lending. But if I, if I could add something which is very relevant, um, especially for Switzerland, and which also, of course, is, is, is you know potentially the case for the U.S., um, you should not be afraid of you know having a currency which is appreciating because it's, it actually pushes you to you know to be innovative, you know, to reform your your country. Switzerland has managed you know to go through such a currency shock. In the U.S., um, uh, being afraid of a too strong U.S. dollar and therefore delaying in hike in interest rate is something which I personally would consider to be detrimental for further economic development. Uh, this is, uh, we needed an hour and a half. There is so much uh, to discuss. Uh, well, I thank you very much for your patience and let's give a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. The session is over.